What do you shoot then? I have to play it off. Committee will come to order. No, 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 not anymore. Today, the committee will consider legislation to extend benefits to federal employees and domestic partnership. We also have the naming of several post offices. So what we will do is to uh, start with the uh, postal namings bill first and hope to be able to get all this done before we have uh, votes. Um, so the first order of business will be several postal naming bills. And I ask unanimous consent that these bills be considered in block and read and open to amendment at any time. Th these resolutions and postal naming bills include H.R. 3892, introduced by Representative G.K. Butterfield of North Carolina, designates the facility of the United States Postal Service located at 101 West Highway 64 Bypass in Roper, North Carolina, as the E.V. Wilkins Post Office. H.R. 3951, introduced by Representative Joe Cow Gow, uh, of course, uh, of Louisiana, designates a facility of the United States Postal Service located in New Orleans, Louisiana, as the Roy Rondino uh, Senior Post Office Building. H.R. Uh, 4017, introduced by Representative James McGovern, uh, Massachusetts designated facility of the United States uh, Postal Service located at Shrewsbury, Massachusetts, as the Anne Marie Blute uh, Post Office. Having satisfied the committee's criteria, each of these measures are worthy of support, and I therefore urge uh, their adoption. Does the ranking member have any comments on these bills? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Briefly, we have reviewed these postal namings and resolutions and find that they meet the requirements of the committee. We ask unanimous consent that all members be able to include their uh, statements related to these post offices, and I yield back. Without objection. Any other members seeking recognition to? I ask unanimous consent that the measures previously described be reported favorably by the committee. Without objections, so ordered. This concludes our business, of course, for the Postal Service. Now we go to the other legislation that we have here. The first, the second uh, item uh, is the Domestic Partnership Benefits and Obligations Act of 2009, better known as H.R. 2517. And let me say, I see um, Congresswoman Baldwin in the uh, audience, and of course, uh, uh, and I want to commend her for her outstanding work and, of course, all that she's done to get us to this point today. So I want to salute her for that. Uh, H.R. 2517 makes employment benefits available to federal employees in same-sex domestic partnerships as a matter of simple fairness and equality. This is the right step for the federal government to take at this time. Providing gay and lesbian, leb lesbians federal workers with the same family benefits that their married colleagues receive will ensure that the federal government maintains its role as a model employer in the United States. And it will foster a more inclusive workplace so we can attract the best and brightest Americans to federal service. Make no mistake, we are losing good, dedicated, hardworking individuals from federal employment because the government does not offer family benefits that they have become common in the private sector. Almost 10,000 employers nationally offer benefits to domestic partners. Over 500 of these employers are in the public sector. This includes over 20 state governments and the District of Columbia. 150 local governments and hundreds of educational institutions. A majority of Fortune 500 companies extend benefits to employees with the same sex partners. As these statistics indicate, providing domestic partners benefits to employees not only fosters a more equitable work environment, but it makes good business sense. As the federal government competes, with the private sector, it, rec it, it recruits, recruitment and retention efforts will be strengthened by opening its doors to the widest possible pool of talent. This bill promotes equality and fairness and will also strengthen the civil service. 
That, it, that is why H.R. 2517 is strongly supported by both the White House and the Office of Personnel Management. Companion legislation S-1102 was introduced by Senators Lieberman and Collins and is making its way through the Senate. In the interest of equality and fairness, this bill adds both benefits and obligations. The benefits include health insurance, survivor retirement benefits, life insurance, disability, and family and medical leave. In order to receive these benefits, an employee with a same-sex domestic partner will be required to certify in an affidavit that his or her relationship satisfies specific criteria. Employees and their domestic partners would also assume the ethical obligation that apply to married employees and their spouses, such as financial disclosure requirements, conflict of interest, and anti-nepotism rules. Falsification of information in order to receive benefits could lead to criminal prosecution. I should note that there are some costs associated with this bill. They are relatively minor in the overall picture of the federal employment budget, but they will need to be offset before taking this bill to the floor. The administration has committed to finding a way to pay for this bill so we can comply with House PAYGO rules. The Office of Personnel Management estimates that covering same-sex partners would increase the overall health care costs to the federal government by only 0.2%. Health insurance costs account of a sizable portion of the entire cost of the legislation, extending many of these benefit programs, such as life insurance and long-term care, will not impact the federal budget. Extending benefits to employees in same-sex domestic partnership is manageable from a cost perspective, and it addresses the inequality that unfair choice is currently facing employees in the same-sex relationship. This is a good bill, and I urge all of the members to support it. A lot of work has gone into it, and I want to again salute uh, uh, Congressman Baldwin and all the staff people that who worked so hard to bring us to where we are today. I now yield to the ranking member uh, for his opening statement of comments. I thank the chairman. In the event that members of this committee haven't received the news, we have 10.2 percent unemployment and climbing. Hispanic unemployment is 13.1 percent. African American unemployment is 15.7 percent. And it's beyond that for African-American teens. The fact is, Mr. Chairman, America is suffering. America is cutting back. Americans are losing wages and benefits. Unemployment among African-American male teens exceeded 50 percent. They want jobs. They want health care. And they're going to be shocked to find out a new benefit at, at taxpayers' expense got ahead of a real stimulus to help create private sector jobs. The stimulus has failed to create jobs, and it appears Democratic leadership is debating a choice between two evils. One, wait and hope the stimulus magically starts to shrink unemployment, or two, further run up the record deficit with yet another costly stimulus spending bill. But before we target, <clears throat> before this debate begins in full today, we are taking up a bill that cast aside all concerns about fiscal responsibility in order to bestow a costly new benefit on a select class of Federal employees. Although the Administration has testified that adding health insurance benefits for partners of gay and lesbian employees and retirees would cost only $56 million in 2010, the Administration has not provided an estimate of the cost of the bill, a bill that is not limited to health care benefits. Without a cost estimate, the committee does not know what short or long-term costs the bill may have and what impact the bill may have on premiums. As there is no offset in this bill, only a rumored cut in hospital payments that, if enacted, would affect Northern Virginia and other parts of America disproportionately as we begin paying less than our fair share of hospital reimbursement, it appears that <clears throat> This will yet be another example of a rec reckless deficit spending and another gimmick. Where has the majority's much-touted commitment to PAYGO gone? 
where have all the blue dogs gone? Although we will hear a lot of discussion today about the need to provide benefits for gay and lesbian partners of Federal employees, the bill creates a much broader entitlement. Nearly any two individuals of the same sex could qualify as domestic partners. Under the bill, as long as there are, they are not direct relatives, meaning not family in the conventional sense, the bill as written, in fact, confers the most generous, flexible benefits on same-sex individuals, something not available to opposite sex, not even available to a niece or a nephew. The answer is that the bill is an attempt to circumvent the Defense of Marriage Act, which guarantees the rights of the state to define marriage as a union between a man and a woman. So supporters of the bill <clears throat> don't like the fact that Americans from Maine to California have voted time and time again to defend traditional marriage. For them, the bill is not just about money, and it will cost the taxpayers money, but it is an attempt to put a stick in the eye of American voters by winning an endorsement of Congress in the wake of a defeat after defeat on the state ballot. It is an end run around existing federal law, another smack in the, uh, uh, existing federal law, and another smack at federalisms by progressives. Some supporters of the bill have claimed that it is necessary to establish federal government's uh, competitive parity and that that is the reason for the bill. Mr. Chairman, that argument fa fails the sniff test at a time of 10.2 percent unemployment and dropping wages in America. But more importantly, federal employees average $119,982, or basically $120,000, while the private sector employees earn just $59,909, basically 60, a two to one advantage for the federal workforce. Mr. Chairman, this is not the right bill at the right time. It is flawed in how it describes individuals, but it is uncharacteristically something that I believe flies in the face of past votes, including the amendments we will offer today. Mr. Chairman, I hope you will accept those amendments, and I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen, for his, um, his statement. At uh, this time, I would uh, seek in recognition as the gentleman from Ohio, Congressman Kucinich, who is recognized for five minutes. I want to thank Chairman Towns for holding this important markup on H.R. 2517, the Domestic Partnership Benefits Act of 2009. I'm proud to be a co-sponsor of this historical legislation that ensures federal employees in same-sex relationships receive the same employment benefits as afforded to the partners of federal employees who are married. I want to thank my colleague, uh, Congresswoman Baldwin, for her leadership in this regard. I also want to say that um, I, I think it's important that we be consistent if we uh, remain silent about the uh, multi-million dollar bonuses that are given to Wall Street and uh, simultaneously chastise public employees for the wages they make for working at least 40 hours a week. There's a disconnect there that people will notice. And I also want to say that uh, I think everyone in this Congress wants to see America back to work. We have 15 million Americans out of work. Unemployment affects everyone, straight or gay. Economic and social injustice go hand in hand, and so does economic justice and social justice. And so we are called upon today to try to bring a measure of both social and economic justice to our federal workforce that is entirely consistent with our constitutional duties under equal protection of the law. Federal employees in committed same-sex partnerships are denied the privilege of providing for their partners and their families. As a result of this systematic and institutionalized discrimination, federal employees in same-sex domestic partnerships cannot provide their partners with essential benefits, such as health care, that we as members of Congress uh, can provide to our spouses uh, if we happen to be in a uh, more conventional uh, relationship as would be defined by some members of this committee. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, almost 13 percent of a federal employee's compensation comes from insurance and retirement benefits, significant benefits denied 
to same-sex domestic, same domestic partners. Now, regardless of our beliefs regarding same-sex marriage, this legislation is really insight into who we are. Do we believe in equality? Do we believe in equality enough to afford all employees, regardless of their sexual orientation or their gender identity, access to federal benefits? We have control over this. Do we believe in equality enough to amend our benefit system to ensure that the federal government is the example for equal employment opportunities. So some may think this is about those who are uh, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgendered. It is to an extent, but it's also about who we are. It's about who we are. And when we have to make a judgment with this vote, we're also going to be judged by how we vote, and it's going to tell more about ourselves than it is going to be about the issue. And I uh, respectfully uh, yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the gentleman for his statement about fairness. Uh, this time I'd like to recognize the former chair of this committee, Congressman Burton from Indiana. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the, the, the rules, uh, or, or, or the language in this bill uh, concerns me because of its vagueness. Uh, if you look at the uh, requirements, it says uh, that they are uh, each other's same-sex sole domestic partner and intend to remain so indefinitely. They have a common residence and intend to continue the arrangement, do not have a common residence because of financial employment related or other reasons as identified in the affidavit. They're at least 18 years of old and mentally competent so they can consent to the contract. They share responsibility for a significant measure of each other's common welfare and financial obligations. They're not married to or domestic partners with anyone else and are not related in a way that if the two were op of opposite sex would prohibit legal marriage in the state in which they reside. The problem is, uh, how long do they have to be together? Let's say somebody uh, says, uh, uh, Joe and I uh, moved in together three days ago and he's my domestic partner. Does that qualify them immediately for uh, this coverage? You know, when, I, uh, when my wife passed away uh, about eight years ago, and I got married three years ago, remarried, I had to wait a specific period of time before the benefits that I have could accrue to my wife, my, my now wife of three years, before those benefits uh, could be uh, put in force. There's no provision for that in this bill that I know of. I mean, so somebody could move in in two or three or four days and say, okay, we're claiming the same kind of benefits that, uh, that somebody that got married uh, uh, has to do more. We have to come up with more of a, uh, a qualification before we can get those benefits. The other thing is, what about the premiums? How much money is this going to cost and when do the costs go into effect? Because I don't see anything in here that talks about how much it's going to cost for the domestic partner, who's going to pay it, when does it go into effect, and how much will it cost? And I, so I think there's a lot of questions about this, Mr. Chairman, that need to be answered. And if we go down this path, it seems to me that we ought to clean up this language so that uh, the application of this legislation uh, would be consistent with, uh, with uh, people that get married and, and uh, who are uh, legally entitled to, to the benefits uh, of each other. And with that, uh, I'll yield back the balance of my time. I'd like to thank the gentleman from Indiana for his statement. Uh, this time I yield five minutes to the gentleman from Maryland, uh, Congressman Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And, and uh, Mr. Chairman, I've listened to uh, some of the uh, concerns about the legislation. And, you know, we can go on and on and on, and we'll be saying the same things 30 years from now. Um, I've often said that we have one life to live. This is no dress rehearsal, and this is that life. And we've been charged by the President of the United States to identify and report back to the Office of Personnel Management on any benefits that may be made available under existing statutory authority to federal employees with same-sex domestic partners. President Obama noted that extending many important benefits, such as health care coverage, would require legislative action. 
And we have that opportunity before us today to help ensure equality in the treatment of all Federal employees in health care and other benefit areas. H.R. 2517, the Domestic Partner Benefits and Obligations Act of 2009, which I am a co-sponsor, is intended to provide for the equitable treatment of all employees in the civil service. By submitting an affidavit of eligibility, a Federal employee and his or her domestic partner will be entitled to the same benefits and obligations imposed upon a married Federal employee and his or her spouse. H.R. 2517 is designed to provide Federal employees with same-sex domestic partners access to the major Federal employee benefit programs, including health insurance, retirement and disability benefits, dental and vision benefits, group life insurance, long-term care insurance, compensation for work injuries, family, medical and emergency leave, and benefits for disability, death, and captivity. As the nation's largest civilian employer, the Federal Government has historically been a leader in offering benefits to its employees and fostering an equitable workplace. However, when it comes to offering domestic partner benefits, the Federal Government is clearly lagging behind other public and private sector employers. The number of Fortune 500 companies that extend benefits to employees with same-sex partners has grown significantly from 46 companies, or 9% in 1997, to 286 companies, or 57% in 2009. I urge my colleagues to pass this bill and help ensure equality for all of our Federal employees. As I said before, we will be here at this rate. If we don't move, we'll be here saying these same things 30, 40 years from now. And during that period of time, people will have missed out on the opportunities to share in these benefits that they could have had if we did not act. And so we must act. Uh, and with that, Mr. Chair, uh, I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen, for a statement. Uh, of course, I now yield five minutes to gen a gentleman from Utah, Congressman Chafee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I do appreciate it. It's, um, I recognize the sensitivity of this, uh, this subject, but I also want to stand tall for traditional marriage. I don't think we should be bashful or shy away from the idea that there are some of us who believe in the precepts and believe in traditional marriage. At the heart and soul, we can talk about various issues, and I will, I'm sure, as long as a lot of others are going to talk about financial considerations and whatnot. But at the core of the discussion is, are we going to offer benefits to a new class and designate a new class? I, for one, stand tall for traditional marriage. I think the majority of Amer the American people stand tall for traditional marriage. In fact, 31 times in a row put on a ballot measure in a state, the people of those states have voted in favor of recognizing and continue to recognize traditional marriage as a union between one man and one woman, 30 times, 31 times in a row, including most recently in Maine. Now, at the same time, I think I can stand tall in support of traditional marriage and still have the love and respect, the admiration for those who um, don't necessarily agree with me. I have the greatest respect for my colleague, the sponsor of this bill, Congresswoman Baldwin, and the people that she loves and cares about. And I appreciate the passion and the commitment that she brings in pushing this legislation forward. I have the greatest respect for that. I happen to disagree. That's why we come together in this body. I believe strongly in DOMA, the Defense of Marriage Act. I wasn't here when it was passed, but I support it. I believe that in many ways this legislation and other pieces of legislation that are moving through this body are in direct contrast to DOMA. And I think the legal minds will get together and see how that is uh, as we move forward. 
I would also like to recognize the success that I had in my own state of Utah uh, dealing with some anti-discrimination or non-discrimination statutes that were recently passed in Salt Lake City. The predominant church came together with local uh, uh, officials from both sides of the aisle, Republicans, Democrats, unaffiliated people, people who don't normally participate in the political process, and came together on some important language in Salt Lake City, just outside my district, but nevertheless in my state, that I think should be applauded. And I, I, I appreciate the process and the end result of that, but this is different. This is different. And so while we discuss the nuances of the dollars and all of the other things, at the heart of this discussion is who's going to stand tall for traditional marriage and who's not. And I think it's okay to stand tall for traditional marriage. In fact, I find it sometimes ironic that who, those that preach the most about diversity and diversity of thought are the most critical of those of us that have a different thought and believe in the role of traditional marriage. So I look forward to the discussion. I'm sure it'll continue nationwide far and above this particular bill. But I think I represent the majority of Americans in standing tall for traditional marriage. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman for his statement. Um, this time I'd like to yield five minutes to the gentleman who really um, uh, who headed the subcommittee and who got us here today, a uh, person who does a superb job with the committee, uh, Congressman Lynch from Massachusetts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me, let me just start by addressing some of the points that have been raised here. Uh, first of all, this bill uh, that came through my subcommittee uh, has no impact on the institution of marriage. Secondly, uh, the definition of, of uh, same-sex domestic partners, I, I want to be clear about this. Uh, OPM throughout our history has recognized uh, opposite sex uh, couples uh, in common law marriages. So in any state that recognized common law marriage, basically all you had to do is act like you're married and OPM recognized that marriage as far as federal benefits went for federal employees. So they didn't have to do anything. Nothing formal, no formal ceremony, no attestation of being married. They just had to act like they're married and the federal government recognized those employees as being married. Now, in this case, we have to have a sworn affidavit under the pains and penalties of perjury. There's a whole listing in the bill of uh, what, what folks have to do in order to certify that they're in an established relationship uh, as domestic partners. So there are a lot of safeguards here on uh, uh, gay and lesbian couples that are not at all, uh, haven't been in the past even suggested of... Uh, of opposite sex uh, couples. But let me, let me move on to uh, my, my statement in principle. As I said before, I had an opportunity to, to uh, guide this bill through committee. And uh, while I intended on being brief, I, I apologize for, for uh, taking up the time to address those points. Uh, H.R. 2517 provides that same-sex domestic partners of federal employees be entitled to identical benefits available to married federal employees and his or her spouse. I'd like to thank our colleague, uh, Representative Tammy Baldwin, for taking the, taking the lead on this and for all her hard work on the bill. Earlier this summer, uh, our subcommittee that I chair, the Federal Workforce, Postal Service, and District of Columbia Subcommittee, held both a hearing and a markup on the legislation that is before us today. And at that hearing, we heard from several witnesses who voiced their support of this bill, including the U.S. Office of Personal Personnel Management Director, Mr. John Berry. We also heard from both public and private employees on the merits of providing these benefits for recruitment and retention purposes. Uh, with today's consideration of H.R. 2517, the real issue that we are tackling involves the principle of equality. And that's what this bill is truly about. Uh, the principle of equality that should be commonplace for the federal government as an employer, both in theory and in practice. Currently, there's a gap in that general principle of equality in the federal workplace. Tens of thousands of federal employees 
and their same-sex partners continue to be denied access to employee benefits such as health insurance and retirement savings, which are customarily offered to employees with opposite-sex spouses. In some ways, this amounts to a denial of equal pay for equal work, a fundamental of the federal government's personnel policy. And aside from the basic concepts of fairness and non-discrimination, the need to provide domestic partnership benefits to federal employees should also be evaluated in the light of potential positive impacts such policies can have on the federal government's recruitment and retention capabilities, as well as on the employee productivity and morale. As the subcommittee's July hearing demonstrated, we've let a tremendous amount of talent walk away from the federal employment and seek jobs from employers that already offer these valuable benefits. This legislation must be passed in order for the federal government to continue its role as a first-rate employer. And I'd like to thank Chairman Towns for his, his courage and leadership on H.R. 2517 and to his commitment to correct a longstanding injustice that has resulted in some federal workers not receiving equal pay for equal work. And I, in closing, I do agree with one thing that the ranking member said. Uh, he said that unemployment is at 10.2 percent nationally. But I don't see how discriminating against gay men and women, uh, excuse me, gay men and lesbians, is going to increase, uh, you know, the, the level of employment here in this country. I think that uh, the federal government has a responsibility here to be the shining example of fairness and equality in the workplace. As a former union president, that's what I worked for for a long, real long time. And I think this is... Uh, this is the right time for this, and uh, it's, it's been too long in waiting, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Thank you very much. And again, let me thank the gentleman for his hard work uh, that he has done on this bill. Uh, I'd like to now recognize um, Congressman Fortenberry from the state of Nebraska. Uh, thank you, Chairman Towns. Uh, Mr. Chairman, let me say from the outset that I do oppose this bill, but, but also let me say as Americans, I think we should all detest any form of bigotry or for that matter sexism or racism. Uh, ironically, though, this bill seeks to privilege one group of persons over another. The legislation defines domestic partner in an open-ended and ambiguous manner and creates a privileged class of persons of the same sex. Moreover, the testimony of July 8, 2009 in the Federal Workforce Subcommittee appears to address only the issue of same-sex partnerships based upon sexual intimacy uh, as you also confirmed in your opening statement, Mr. Chairman. Although this legislation purports to stand on a foundation of non-discrimination, it appears to diminish the standing of federal employees who may share the same dwelling and collaborate intimately with an immediate or extended family member of the opposite sex in a non-sexual relationship to meet their basic financial needs. What about the nephew with an aunt who is suffering from cancer? What about those who are in nurturing relationships neither marked by physical intimacy nor qualifying for married dependent status, but share a specialness of bond based on a commitment to duty or to friendship, as in the case of a friend helping a friend of the opposite sex if they were unemployed? What about the daughter struggling to meet the needs of a father or an uncle with Alzheimer's disease, family members who piece together what benefits and resources they might accrue individually to meet their daily needs and assist the ones that they love. Even though many people heroically care for others outside of recognized familial circumstances, federal law has not recognized these relationships nor, call, nor the ones called for in this bill for the purpose of benefits that have accrued to the state of marriage for a variety of reasons. Now, extrapolating from the testimonies offered before the Federal Works, Workforce Subcommittee, where the argument was given that the bill was necessary to attract the best and the brightest to federal service, what message does that send, Mr. Chairman, that only same-sex partners are the best and brightest because they share the type of relationship this bill seeks to privilege? Moreover, I am concerned by the tenuous implication set forth during the subcommittee hearing that not enacting this measure would somehow impede federal workforce recruitment. Clearly, this legislation also begs the question of marriage and why societies throughout the world, past and present, hold in common the institution of marriage. The bill seeks to unravel that standard with social implications and practical concerns about enforcement. 
This legislation would, would set a precedent that is in stark contrast to the Defense of Marriage Act and with the established precedents of common law as well as codified federal statute. It provokes the aforementioned discriminatory problem as we seek to define who appropriately qualifies for be federal benefits outside of this established standard, this construct upon which orderly social custom and federal law are premised. So with Mr. Mr. Chairman, with that, uh, the implications for marriage aside, I, I must conclude that the legislation is objectively discriminatory and is flawed, and I am going to not support it. I yield back. Right. Thank you, gentlemen, for his statement. Uh, now we recognize the gentlewoman from District of Columbia, Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton. Well, Mr. Chairman, if I may say so, I think I know discrimination when I see it. Uh, and I think this is exactly the opposite. This is a civil rights bill, and the other side better come to understand uh, what civil rights means in our country today. I want to thank especially Chairman Lynch, because in his usual diligent and fair fashion, it is his hearing that exposed all of the arguments on, on both sides and brought us to this day. And to my good friends on the other side, especially my good friend, the ranking member who brought up African-American unemployment, and I'd be pleased to work with him if he is uh, uh, interested in, in that, as I'm sure he is. I, I want to stress that many of us are working on uh, unemployment and jobs, but the centerpiece of, of this legislation, if you get down to the nuts and bolts, is health insurance because the other benefits are de minimis or don't involve the federal budget. And if I may say so, Mr. Chairman, uh, that I did not notice that the other side of the aisle uh, was with us in getting health insurance, which now every African American will have if the bill we passed here last term uh, in fact gets through. So we're interested in people from my community. I think we've already taken a, a great leap forward there, and I'd be pleased to work with anyone on the other side who wants to work further. Uh, it's time we did the same thing for same-sex couples that we've now done for African Americans, all of whom, because our bill covers virtually 100 percent of the people in the United States. Let's do the same for, for same-sex couples. Um, uh, the former chair of our committee talked about a waiting period. Well, you know, the reason they have to engage in a waiting period is they can't get married in most states, as they will soon be able to do, I am proud to say, in the District uh, of Columbia. I want to uh, uh, applaud um, my good friend and colleague, Tammy Baldwin, for the leadership she has taken on this bill, and to note that the American people are way in front of us. Uh, we, we finally passed the first piece of federal legislation affecting our gay uh, brothers and sisters with the hate crimes bill, and we had 10 years to do that. Uh, if you look at where people stand on ENDA, the employment discrimination bill, uh, you will see that the American people are for that, and we haven't been able to get that through here. Well, we've just finished having a landmark uh, uh, health care fight, and we succeeded in passing an extraordinary health care bill. Now, what we have here uh, is, uh, at bottom, a bill that would say for 0.2 percent of that budget, let's cover men and women who serve in the public service of the United States of America. Let's give them equal rights with their colleagues who serve the United States uh, of America. Um, this is a bipartisan sponsored bill uh, in the Senate. The President of the United States has already given us a head start with his executive order. Um, as to what discrimination and anti-discrimination means, just as white people were totally unaffected and put in no more disadvantaged position. When black people got the same rights as white people, married people uh, of the opposite sex will be put in no disadvantaged position if same-sex couples have the same benefits through the federal service that they now have. And if the time has come and way overdue for what I believe this a committee will do today, and I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your leadership and Chairman Lynch 
uh, for guiding us this far on onto the House floor, I say. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the gentlewoman from uh, Washington, D.C. for her comments. Recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Quigley. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Quigley. Mr. Quigley from Illinois. Mr. Quigley. Oh, I, I thought yield. you said yeah. the gentleman from Illinois. No, I would yield, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> no, that's all right. My, my <laughs> dear friend from Illinois. We, we, we I don't want to begin to jump seniority on the, <laughs> my senior I, friend I, from. I'm, I'm happy to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you uh, so much, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, my crack staff delivered a top-notch presentation for me today, but um, I, I just want to speak from the heart for just a moment here. Uh, I was the chairman of an identical measure. Uh, I was the chairman of the Human Rights Committee in Cook County in Chicago uh, of an exact duplicate measure that we, I sponsored and passed in Cook County. Now, Cook County has five million people. It is one of the largest budgets in the country. It has a population greater than most states. And it's just fascinating to watch the doomsdayers who talk about doing these things and what it means morally and financially to our governments. Uh, to all the municipalities and the uh, businesses that have done the, passed this sort of measure, it has meant nothing but maintaining a high quality workforce and maintaining an environment that speaks of justice and equity for everyone. It didn't break anyone's budget, didn't come close. Um, it still maintains extraordinarily widespread public support, and it's the right thing to do. But I'm still struck by things that are said about it. For anyone who's faced the kind of discrimination that gays, lesbians, bisexual, transgender community have uh, dealt with, to be called a select group must be a tragic comedy. Um, we just passed a very important measure dealing with hate crimes to say, oh, what a great select group. I mean, uh, what, where's the history of the gay and lesbian community being treated as a select group? Uh, it's just extraordinary. It, rather, it is a group of Americans which have been discriminated against for all time. And if that passes as being a select or privileged group, I mean, leave me out. Uh, it's just, uh, it's hard to fathom. And for those who evoke the concept of what a traditional marriage is, I would just respectfully suggest we're not talking about strangers here. We I mean, look around. These are our friends. These are our family members. These are our neighbors. Um, I, I would suggest if you're going to evoke and, and try to create a theocracy here, that most of those face involve incorporating it and, and in involving everyone and caring about everyone. So it, it's very tough when you start deciding, I'm the one who's going to decide what's traditional and not you. And it's hard to watch that, especially when you know people in 20 and 30 year gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender tr relationships. Uh, I'm reminded of something. I, I feel like at some point we're switching sides here. And I say this with the greatest respect. I think of Barry Goldwater. Barry Goldwater, who said, y you don't have to be straight to shoot straight, talking about supporting gays in the military. But he also took it a step farther. He said the traditional conservative movement was about keeping government out of people's lives. I think I've heard that before, that we shouldn't have Big Brother telling people how they should feel or what they should do. I think for a really long time now, what is the most intimate decision you can make in your life? It is who you love and how to express that love. So now we're going to be the arbiters of that. We're going to decide, well, that's not the kind of love we're talking about. That's not the love that our God cares about. I think you're really stepping uh, over a major source there if you think that's OK. It's, it's extraordinary to watch. It's painful to watch Americans live without benefits, to be treated differently, who do nothing but contribute and are solid Americans, many of which, many of whom have gone across the seas and fought for this country and been killed or blown apart because they love this country and they come home and they can't have the same benefit. Because of DOMA, as been talked about here, 
there's a couple thousand benefits that they're deprived of through no fault of their own. So um, I guess I'm left with a reminder that tomorrow is the anniversary of Lincoln's speech at Gettysburg, to quote another great Republican. Think about what he was really saying. With the greatest respect, I think what he was saying was 87 years ago, we created a country in which we decided that all men were created equal. And today, he spoke at Gettysburg, we had to decide if we really meant it. So I think those decisions come around every once in a while. And with the greatest respect with those who have an honest difference of opinion, this is one of those times when we have to ask ourselves if we really mean it, if all are created equal. Thank you. I yield back. Souter. At this time, I yield um, to the gentleman from Indiana, Congressman Souter. As far as I recall, and as long as I recall, we've always had a traditional standard of marriage in this country that we have, uh, regardless of, of our failures and where we've uh, uh, fallen individually, we've always acknowledged that our goal is to have uh, life partners of the same sex in our government, including under Abraham Lincoln, has uh, recognized that. And this bill today is uh, a direct uh, really direct debate over marriage and anybody who claims it's less so is being disingenuous uh, in our federal benefits package and in our our government and our society we we have said that there should be incentives and rewards uh, for being married and are treated that way uh, that uh, this attempt today is attempt to change that standard to undermine that standard uh, it should be seen as basically a vote on a, on a marriage amendment. It's a vote on whether or not uh, you believe uh, that uh, uh, homosexuals and gays and lesbians should be treated uh, the same as a traditional uh, marriage. And you can have strong opinions that differ, but we should acknowledge what the vote actually is. Uh, I debated this extensively in the subcommittee, and I'd ask unanimous consent to insert those remarks into the record. Thank you very much. Um, I now yield to the gentleman from Illinois, this time Mr. D Congressman Davis, this time for real. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and um, I want to thank you for moving this process along. I also want to commend um, Representative Baldwin for the tremendous leadership that she has provided, not only on this issue, but a variety of issues in the Congress that deal with the rights, hopes, and aspirations of all human beings. I am delighted to have the opportunity to vote on a piece of legislation that I think catches up to where I have considered myself as being for as long as I can remember. Because I can remember even as a small child wondering why some people were treated differently than others. I often used to wonder why some people were wealthy and others were poor. Why some people seemingly did certain kinds of work and others did not. Why some people had resources that they could make use of and others could not. And so when we talk about the issue of human rights, one of the most basic of all human desires is to be treated fairly, to be treated equally, to have equal opportunity and equal protection under the law. All of those are the essential components that helped to make America, that have caused us to become the nation that we all feel that we are. And so it is unsettling to me to think that because of the way that someone might feel, the way that they may act, or the way that they may behave, Circumstances under which their feelings they had no absolute control over, that the rest of us would sit in a kind of judgment to deny for them the very same things 
that we would want for ourselves. The best way to express real humanity is to want for other people the very same things that you desire for yourself. And so I'm pleased to vote in favor of this measure. I support it wholeheartedly and would urge all of my colleagues to let's help make America one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And I yield back. Thank you very much, and as you know, that the votes have been called, and I understand there's several. Uh, we will take uh, Mrs. Watson, and then after that, you know, uh, I'm sorry, it's this okay. side here, Mr. Mr. McHenry, you're right. And then after that, uh, we will, what we'll do is we'll go and vote, and we will resume at 4.15. And of course, uh, the votes that, we, that might occur, we will roll the votes. As you know, we have some members on financial services, and they're also meeting, so, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, do you yield for just a second? I'd be delighted to yield to the gentleman yeah, just from a California. Second. Uh, I found uh, something on my desk stating the position of a religious organization as to a bill that will be in front of us. And I'd like to have maybe our uh, legal representative respond as to whether a tax exempt religious organization with separation of trace and state able to lobby us and put on our uh, committee desk mm -hmm. a position for or against legislation. So I don't need an answer now. I just wanted to make that point and raise that question. Thank you very much for yielding. Right, right. Okay, uh, we have, would, uh, I would just say to the gentlewoman that we will uh, have counsel to look into it and at this time we'd recognize a gentleman from uh, North Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, it, it, the, the email in question is from the U.S. Conference of Cash, Catholic Bishops uh, explaining uh, that they are uh, opposed uh, to the bill that we're marking up today to be specific about what the, uh, my colleague from California said. Um, and it is not uncommon for them to express uh, their views on uh, issues that would uh, affect uh, the church and uh, our society in general. Uh, that's not uncommon. Um, and other colleagues on, on the other side of the aisle have, have already asked uh, for a review by the IRS of the uh, Catholic Church's uh, tax-exempt status. So that's a whole larger fight um, that some of, on the far left are engaging in. Um, the issue here today, uh, listening to my colleagues, the discussion seems to be about uh, civil unions or homosexual marriage. And, and that is the discussion uh, that, that my colleagues are debating. The issue before us today is whether or not uh, federal employees can deem someone um, a, a partner for the purposes of getting benefits paid for by the taxpayers. Um, and we can discuss this any number of ways, but one way that we can discuss it is in terms of the cost to the taxpayer um, and the fact that this bill would allow one individual to, to, via affidavit, certify that they're in a relationship with another person, thereby giving them benefits, and all their children uh, as well. So potentially you have a, a far-reaching uh, piece of legislation here. Um, and while the argument is about fairness, um, the substance of what we're dealing with is about granting benefits to a certain class of people and even a certain sex. Um, and there's a certain, a certain level of discrimination within this bill because it would only allow uh, the benefits to be given to same-sex couples. Um, so in and of itself there, uh, it, it causes further problems. Uh, but let's be clear, this is about uh, federal employees' health benefits not the debate about uh, the definition of marriage. So let's talk about what is before us today. If the majority wants to bring forward a uh, civil union or a homosexual marriage bill before this committee, 
um, or before this Congress. They certainly have a majority and they certainly have the right to schedule the calendar as they see fit. And we can have that debate for that day. But let's discuss health care benefits and let's make sure that our, our, our debate is, is covered in that regard. And that's what I'd ask my colleagues to engage in. And I'd be happy to yield to my colleague from Nebraska. Uh, I thank the gentleman for the time. I would also like to point out that I regularly receive communications, as I am sure we all do, from organizations who have not-for-profit status, religious organizations, those who do not have a confession of faith but nonetheless have a belief system, Islamic organizations, Jewish organizations, Protestant organizations, Catholic organizations, even organizations that have a very defined set of um, visions for humanity, such as Planned Parenthood, regularly commit their ideas for consideration to us. So singling out one entity because of a sheet of paper that ends up here, I find to be peculiar, Mr. Chairman. And with that, I yield back to the well gentleman. Said, yeah. And with that, I yield back. Right. But, uh, let me just say that um, thank you, gentlemen, for his comments. Um, we will now uh, recess until 4.15, and we will return at 4.15. I repeat, we will return at 4.15. Fifteen.
Ele vê. I recognize the gentlewoman from California, Congresswoman Chu. You've still got people. Thank you, uh, Chairman Towns. Uh, I speak today in strong support of the Chairman's substitute amendment to H.R. 2517, the Domestic Partnership Benefits and Obligations Act of 2009. And as a new member of the committee, it's exciting and rewarding to be a part of this next step towards this legislation, which finally offers employment and health care benefits to same-sex domestic partners of federal employees. Uh, as a co-sponsor of the original bill, introduced by representatives uh, Baldwin and Ross Lettinen. I strongly believe that same-sex domestic partners of federal employees should be entitled to the benefits of their partners, just as married couples do. Because same-sex domestic partners currently don't have marriage equality on the federal level, they aren't privy to the same rights and benefits as heterosexual married couples, and as a result, they're treated like second-class citizens. It's unacceptable for someone like former U.S. Ambassador Ambassador Michael Guest, who loved his job and his country, to be forced to resign from government service because his partner of many years did not receive the benefits and allowances given to spouses of ambassadors. The issue on the table today is not about marriage equality or, or the Defense of Marriage Act, which this legislation does not affect. It's about extending equality, fairness, and access